What's up, Watchtower here? I'm Robin. I'm Mike. And uh, we're coming at you on December 31st, 2018, New Year's Eve. And we just wanted to wish everybody a Happy New Year. Yeah. And um, a lot of ex Jehovah's Witnesses have been making yearly roundup videos. <laughs> so we thought we might make our yearly roundup, although we haven't made very many videos this year so far. Um, a little late to start now. I know, a little, a little late to start now, but maybe 2019 you'll be seeing more from us. Who knows? <laughs> well, that's one thing that I've actually been noticing this year especially. Um, I think it was like in 2016 when we had first started making our videos there was a huge on uh, outpouring of new videos and new people making videos on YouTube mm -hmm. and then we saw that slow down a little bit in 2017 and even the beginning part of 2018 there wasn't a lot of activity there but in the last few months I have seen dozens and dozens of new YouTube channels yeah. start, which is awesome. Right. So. It, it's really good. And so we're glad that other people ha are carrying the torch, <laughs> yeah. as it were, and um, sharing their stories and talking about current events. And uh, yeah, there's just been a, a ton of, you know, when you look back over the years, over this past year it's just been you know we can't even keep up with all the stories that are coming out mm -hmm. he brought a story to my attention today that I posted on our Facebook page our what's up watchtower Facebook page and I had meant to post it it came out December 14th but it's just like there's so many different stories coming out about you know elders abusing children and mm -hmm and or ministerial servants or maybe they're not even any kind of servant but you know it was known and it was reported to the elders and they never reported to the police and you know all these stories that are coming out in fact i just uh was was messaging with someone earlier today who contacted us through what's up watchtower and just now waking up uh, after 40 years of of being in the organization or around it and uh, was also a victim of child abuse mm -hmm. so you know I mean I was gonna say if that's the one theme the one thing I think everyone has learned in 2018 is that Jehovah's Witnesses do not contact the authorities when someone has been abused in their organization I mean, that has just become the theme yeah. of the year. And that's what they're going to be known for around the world. Right. Because this is their calling card now. Yeah, because in every court case that we've seen that's come through, mm -hmm. authorities were never contacted. Yep. Never contacted. Right. And we started hearing about this in the Australian Royal Commission right. about how no authorities were contacted for over a thousand uh, incidents of uh, sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. but. I don't think people really realized this is the worldwide standard right. for the organization. You do not get outsiders involved in your organization. It's a systemic problem. And, you know, these people who have fooled themselves into believing that the organization renders Caesar's things to Caesar and that they would certainly never do anything wrong or break Caesar's laws and that, oh, where states require mandatory reporting, we report. Well, we have found out that is just a lie. That is a bold-faced lie. Yeah. And they are being fined and the juries are ruling against them. Look at the Montana case from just a couple of months ago. $35 million judgment against Watchtower. Mm -hmm. So it's going to hit them in the pocketbook where it hurts and they, they're going to either have to change their policies or they're not going to survive financially. No, um, and as they were talking about in the show I just watched what might have been the In Focus episode, it seems like their growth in you know, I guess first world countries, the United States, Canada, the UK, a lot of Europe, 
um, that growth is is in negative numbers. Yeah, it's stagnant. So ne the, ne negative or stagnant. A lot of not them, even keeping up with the population growth. A lot of them are negative numbers, yeah. especially in Europe. So I feel like that's you're gonna start seeing more and more Jehovah's Witnesses, and this was brought out in another video that they're gonna start growing in countries that are poorer countries, third world countries, uh, countries that have a history of the people being very um, religious, mm -hmm. you know, so that's where they're gonna be able to continue, but in countries like the United States, Canada, UK, no, not it's not gonna, gonna happen. happen. No. Not gonna happen. So, so anyways, there's just been, you know, with the Leah Remini special on Jehovah's Witnesses, which uh, preceded the uh, the launch of the third season of her show about Scientology, uh, with the A and E special with Elizabeth Vargas that featured uh, Rami Michelle and Barbara Anderson. Yeah. That was back in the summer. And there was uh, the Canadian. There was some stuff in Canada the, too. The uh, they had a news. The show. channel two, I think it was, uh, which is uh, very similar to like Dateline or sixty Minutes here in the United States, their coverage of um, the problem there and many victims there. And yeah, it's um, it's been an exciting year for exposure. There's been a couple of movies, there's been uh, Apostasy and The Children's Act, and uh, I haven't seen either one of those movies. <laughs> it's hard. It's, it's hard. It's hard for me to want to watch those movies. You know, um, yeah. I've heard that the movie Apostasy is great. I've lived that life. It's like I don't feel. I don't know. I haven't wanted to watch it, and that's I think just. It me. would be triggering to watch it yeah. <laughs> for me. I would just get angry all over again. <laughs> if I'm gonna spend two hours or an hour and a half of my time, I generally want to do it doing something that I will enjoy or get benefit from. And I know that this movie is benefiting people out there, but I don't know. I'm just not ready for it yet. Yeah, I'm sure I will watch it. I uh, just haven't gotten to it yet. <laughs> it's like a little close to home, you know? It's like, yeah, I've lived, I've lived that. That's been the entire story of my life. So, uh, you know, but I think it's super important that people are creating these projects because it gives the outside world a view into our lives that they never knew. Yeah, I, I've had many people reach out to me who watched the Leah Remini special and have, you know, basically were like, I never knew, I never knew that this is what you came from. And so that, that's been, that's been good to see, you know, people to really start to understand or at least try to understand more of uh, what we ta we're talking about, you know. Um, because any of you, you know, maybe your current Jehovah's Witnesses, maybe you've already left, it's difficult to talk to people who weren't in it because they don't really get what we went through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and even after you leave, you start unpacking all these layers of cognitive dissonance, of things that, you know, you originally thought, oh, that didn't affect me, that didn't affect me. But then you start realizing, actually, it mm -hmm. did affect me. It, it did. It has had an effect. It shaped my worldview. Um, and really realizing, like, how calloused we were towards people. Mm -hmm. um, when, such as when the, uh, the, the sad story, and that was one of the videos we actually did make earlier this year about the, the family in Kigo Harbor, mm -hmm. um, the, the murder-suicide. And later to read uh, follow-up news stories about her Jehovah's Witness family, uh, what, what was her name? I, I, I can't, I'm oh, sorry, her name escapes me right now. But either way, her Jehovah's Witness family, and in particular, her Jehovah's Witness sister, who said, yeah, I'm not surprised by this. And basically, the news reporter and the police officer 
who got, you know, who she said that to, said they were very um, surprised by the callousness of her family after this happened. And, you know, there's a humanity that's just shut down when you look at people and suffering mm -hmm. that people go through. And that includes your own family. That includes people within your own congregation that are suffering. That you might feel, if they're regular at the meetings and you're good friends with them, you might feel sorry for their depression or the things that, you know, the emotional trauma that they're going through. But if they were to stop coming and say they just don't know that they believe in this anymore, that close friend would shut down their emotion immediately and want nothing to do with them anymore. And then when a tragedy happens, like they commit suicide, um, there's just there's just a lack of humanity. Yeah, I was, um, if you guys saw some of our earlier videos from the year, uh, I actually attended a funeral this year that was um, somebody I knew growing up that committed suicide. Uh, they were raised as a Jehovah's Witness. They committed suicide, and um, that was in May. So I go to the to the service, um, and it was just a lot of witnesses were there. I did recognize some people. But I thought it was just bizarre um, how the people acted. It's like they're not in touch with loss, if that makes sense. Not just death, but that's a, probably the best example. But witnesses aren't in touch with any kind of real loss because they feel like they're going to be given a do-over, a second chance. <laughs> You know, so like whatever you lose in this world, you'll gain in the next one or, or, or whatever. I'm super simplifying it. Right. But it was shocking to me that people I had known personally had been to their homes and, you know, spent a lot of time with them growing up that they wouldn't even acknowledge my existence when I was there. And I was just going to give a hug and say sorry for your loss and that kind of stuff. But... So yeah, the turning off of the humanity switch is something that I got to witness more firsthand this year. Um, I was surprised by it, really, because it's not the type of... I would just think, now this is just me being a human being, that if you come together over a tragic circumstance like this, you should be able to like let bygones be bygones, give each other a hug, and be like, look, we've been in each other's lives, this is a tragic moment. I'm sorry for it. I'm not trying to preach to you, I'm not trying to be preached to. I'm not here for that. You're not here for that. But they are so disconnected from the human qualities that they reject everything. Mm. You know, it was just shocking. It was eye opening to me because I always knew that if I disassociated, my parents wouldn't talk to me anymore. I expected that. But you don't expect the little things. Sometimes the little things, you're like just surprised. You're like, oh, so that's how it's going to be? You know, mm -hmm. it's just weird. And well, it, what was also bizarre that you told me was that it was not because this young man, I, I was he disfellowshipped? Or at least he wasn't active. He and was I, not active. I don't believe he was a witness, but as far as disfellowship or anything like that, I don't know. Yeah, but it was held at a, a funeral home, correct? Mm -hmm. At a public facility, not even a funeral home. This was at a place that's rented for art shows and for whatever. I mean, just a meeting place. Okay. Um, well, public. at any rate, that's not the point. The point was they, they did have a a witness, a brother, give a funeral talk, a memorial talk, mm, right? No, um, he just said a few words. It wasn't witnessy. It wasn't? A... The thing that, that I remember the most from that. Okay, because I wasn't there, and he just, so I don't, so they maybe gave I'm a, not So they gave a little talk of a little, just, you know, this was his life or whatever, and every time that somebody said something, everybody clapped. <laughs> That's what it was. And I was like, 
we're at a funeral service and they had like a, a, a video display of some like photos and stuff just running like a, a, a what do they call that? A slideshow. And um, when the slideshow was over, everybody clapped like they're at the meeting. And that was bizarre to me because how inappropriate they don't know how that? to act. They don't know how to mourn. Yeah. They don't know how to to behave in a situation of loss like this because we're told not to not to mourn as the world mourns because of our hope. And as a result, people just don't know how to act mm -hmm. in a tragic situation like that. Um, but anyway, so that was something that happened this year. Um, you know, it's just, it's a, it opened a window that I didn't get to really see the organization from that particular view before. So that's what it did for me is it just kind of gave me a view into a very specific type of situation that I hadn't ever been a part of before. Mm -hmm. And looking at it from the outside, I was like, these people are crazy. <laughs> Straight up, these people are crazy. <laughs> the way they're acting is crazy. You know, um, granted it was an odd situation, but... Yeah. Whew. So we can add one more, unfortunately, to the list of people we've known who have committed suicide, who were Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and that list keeps growing. I, I heard of, um, I reconnected with someone from way, way past growing up uh, earlier this year, and someone we knew that was a good friend of his committed suicide also. And I didn't know that, I found that out. Um, but, you know, just, all of us ex-witnesses know of people who committed suicide. Well, all of us who are ex-witnesses have probably had that thought at one point or another. Just being straight up honest. Oh, yeah. Um, because living in that type of disconnect leads to great depression. It leads to depression. It leads to almost like a, you're not in your own body type of a situation. It's weird. You know, you can get in such a funk, you know, and everybody I've known who was a witness at one point or another has gone through some really hard times, you know? Yeah. Everybody. Like suicidal thoughts. Yeah. To a great extent, I've known quite a few people who... And, and there's a reason. And it's not just because, oh, we're living in the last days, times are hard. No, it's because you feel helpless because you're told that you can never measure up. Everything you do is so greatly scrutinized mm -hmm. it's n it, and you're never doing enough. So you feel like you can never measure up, that you're probably going to be destroyed anyways. And if you ended your life, maybe Jehovah would forgive you and resurrect you. And then you would wake up in paradise. And maybe you wouldn't sin worse to where you couldn't make it you right. know like if i don't know the it the thing i realize and we've talked about it a lot because we grew up as jehovah's witnesses so when you talk about the fear in their teachings you know the way that they teach you know the end is coming there's no time there's no time for anything the end is right around the corner when when you are raised like that and as a kid, and this is something I've been thinking about lately, is, you know, especially like with the, one of the lawsuits that's happened, not a lawsuit, something happened with the witnesses because they were showing videos <laughs> at the conventions that were not approved. I think that was in Stockholm. Okay, in Sweden, by the government because they don't want people showing inappropriate propaganda. material or religious propaganda, propaganda to children and things like that. So they monitor when you have an audience of mixed ages, they need to approve what's being shown to the audience. And that kind of and thinking about that kind of stuff has really this year got me to think a lot about mm -hmm. all of the things that I thought about when I was a kid. 
Now, in the My Book of Bible Stories, the one that was popular when we were kids, the first edition, <laughs> when it came out in like 1977 or something, there are <laughs> numerous pictures of murder, yeah. bloodshed. I mean, there's a picture of Cain and Abel where Cain had like killed Abel and like hit him under his arm and there was blood all over the ground. <laughs> I remember that from like a little kid. I remember thinking specifically about being wounded to hear and dying and bleeding out, you know? The, the woman who put the tent stake in the dude's head. Um, a lot of you know, violence just... in that book. Though that's what somebody made a, a, a meme of my book of horror stories that was the same font and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and then I started thinking, okay, so this is what we were raised on. Mm -hmm. War, death, murder, destruction, spirits, witches, people being stoned, demon possessions. Um, this was our childhood. This was our life. <laughs> and, you know, when you think about it, you're like, that's super screwed up that that is what you're teaching your child, that everyone on earth is gonna die, that we may be tortured and captured. They may torture you mm -hmm. to get the names of the brothers and sisters that are in your kingdom hall, and you can't give it up, even if it means your death. Mm -hmm. This is what we were Oh, uh, those were the things that I used to think about as a child. Oh, you know, if they, if they torture me, the, Please don't let them pull out my teeth. I was so afraid that my teeth were going to get pulled out for some reason. That was mm -hmm. one of the things that I used to think. If they're going to torture me, I hope they don't pull out my teeth. And so much, and you probably remember this too, that there were no phone lists for the congregation. For a long time, there, were never, there was never a, a written phone list of people in the congregation because... And I remember my parents telling me this, we don't want anything in writing because if the authorities come to, to shut us down and they want a list of all the brothers and sisters, we don't want anything in writing that they can find. Which brings me back, which is exactly right, which brings me back to the convention videos from a year or two ago to tell you that for the last 30 years, the Jehovah's Witnesses have been saying to my personal I have personal knowledge of this mm -hmm. for the last 40 years they've been saying the exact same thing so while there were no bunker videos in 1980 at the conventions they were still saying the same things mm -hmm. and the fact that their message hasn't changed in almost half a century I mean, I, I was telling Robin the other day, okay, so I spend a lot of my free time when I'm working listening to the, not just the meetings, not just the conventions, because there's two kingdom halls at least that stream all of their meetings on YouTube. So I see a meeting from the United Kingdom and I see a meeting from Florida. And so I've been watching a lot of meetings and assemblies and stuff on, um, I, I lost my train of thought. Well, you watch, he watches a ton and he listens to oh, talks. That's what I was going to yeah. say. So I'm listening to talks that were recorded in the 80s and 90s. These are talks that people have recorded with tape recorders and stuff and they put them up online. And I, it was maybe three weeks ago that the congregation in North Apopka, Florida, that has one of their meetings, their public talks and everything streamed online. They just gave a public talk that I just listened to a recording of that was from the 90s. And I tried so hard to find the original one from the 90s that I listened to, but I literally listened to so many talks that I couldn't find it. So I was just shocked. It's the same outline, obviously. But it's 30 years later, 25 years later, and I had just heard the same talk that week so it's not like I, I i didn't understand that it was the same talk and i was just shocked to myself going 30 years the light's getting brighter this is the same exact public talk 30 years ago <laughs> nothing has changed nothing has changed except for now they cannot hide they can't hide what 
what they're doing wrong. They can't hide mm -hmm. the things that they lied about, the things that they got wrong, that they won't admit to. Um, and it was shocking to me, in a way shocking, but I guess when you look at the way the governing body does things, I guess not so shocking, but that at the summer convention, one of the, the videos was basically making fun of the people who believed the end was going to come in 1975. Oh. When they got that from the top, that came from the top, that came from the president of, mm -hmm. you know, France, who came up with the 7,000 years of human history ending in, in October uh, or in the fall of 1975. And it's reasonable to conclude that you know, and people who sold everything, making light of people who literally ruined their financial lives mm -hmm. by listening to that bull. And one of them, I mean, it was our good friend, Susan Gaskin. Her father had a really good job with the government and he gave it up and, you know, they downsized and whatever. And he took, I think, a janitorial job so that he could pioneer. And he never could get that that kind of position ever again so i mean and the system was going on how much longer than 75 40 <laughs> how many years so the fact that they made light of you know actually making fun of people that that took that seriously when they were being told to take it seriously just the way they're going to make fun of the witnesses now when they talk about the overlapping generation in 40 years I go, oh, we didn't really mean that. Are you serious? <laughs> you people believe that? And that's, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot this year as well. Not that, that specific, but how do my parents still believe this garbage? I think about that a lot because it's so clear there's nothing hidden. There's no hidden answers. The answers are right there. Go to your encyclopedia and look up when was Jerusalem destroyed. It was not 607. Simple, simple, simple things prove that this is not the truth. S the simplest of things. With one encyclopedia, you can prove that this isn't the truth. And so when the witnesses do a JW broadcasting talking about how they do all their research and that primarily they use encyclopedias and books and magazines and well, if you look in the books, you look in the magazines, you look in the encyclopedias, you get different answers than they get. So it's super frustrating to me. It's one of the things that bugs me the most that I probably will never get out of my head when the answers are right there and people won't look at them. And when I say, look, this doesn't say what you say it says, I'm called a liar. Right, you're the apostate. Yeah. That, that's something that, that will probably always bother me as well. And um, the only way I can make peace with it is to realize that they have so much fear fear of what if they're wrong like fear of like if they left it but what if it was but what if it was the truth um, there's that and there's many people um, I might have had that thought once or twice after I left what if it is actually the truth but you know then I started reasoning everything out again in my head and I'm like no there's no way it's the truth but also realizing it's the the fear of my whole life has been a waste mm -hmm. and a lie and having to admit that it, it it's got to be that's got to be very painful well it is and I mean it's not just that it's not just like oh my life is a lie oh this isn't gonna happen oh crap I'm gonna die oh crap I'm gonna get old or maybe sick and I'm gonna die Right. This is go it's going to happen. But it's not just 
you know, in our situation where we were born into it and raised in it, but it's, I chose to join this religion and I believed it Mm -hmm. and I believed everything they told me. And with every change that came, I believed it was the light getting brighter. I didn't realize that it was because they had so many things wrong and that they were making adjustments, not because Jehovah is speaking to them <laughs> as his channel, but <laughs> because like, because they were being proven wrong and they had to change it. Well, just I remember something that I just learned in the last year or so. Now, if you were raised as a Jehovah's Witness um, and you're anywhere close to our age, you'll know this, but like, you'll remember when we used to charge money for the Watchtower and Awake magazines Mm -hmm. at the door. I think they were 20 cents each when I first started, then 25 cents each, then 50 cents each, whatever. But we used to collect money at the doors for that. Well, we were told when they did away with that arrangement that this is gonna be more beneficial for the people of the householders, it's gonna be, it's it's basically God's will. But what we weren't told is that they couldn't charge money for these magazines legally or they would lose their charitable status. So, you know, we were fed one lie to cover up another lie. Mm -hmm. And we all felt good about the lie. We're helping people. But we were lied to Mm -hmm. straight up. And, and that's a stupid lie yeah. because honestly, why don't you just say to the publishers in the congregation, you know what? The government is challenging our status. So in order to not have any issues with the government, we're just not going to charge for these magazines and let Jehovah bless our efforts. That would have been so simple. It, everyone would say, yes, I totally get that. We don't want to lose our, char- our charitable status. Let's work harder in the ministry and get this done. It's a stupid lie. Why lie about that when everyone, I think everyone would understand that. Yeah. You know, so this is the thing. You have lies when no lies are needed because it's the culture of Watchtower society to be secretive, Mm -hmm. to be, to hide things because that's just how it is. Because why? They obviously do have stuff to hide. Yeah. You know? That is for sure. People who have nothing to hide, hide nothing. Yes. They're very secretive. And if, if nothing else, that has, that has become so much plainer to us just in the past year. I mean, we started making videos almost three years ago, and we didn't even realize how secretive mm-hmm. and, and really diabolical this organization, like we're this year, things that have come out, things that have come out in, in news stories and mm-hmm. and whatever, has really driven that home. That it's not only a covering up, it's really diabolical. Yeah, because not it's not like society doesn't know about these things. They know about these things. They know about everything. They have spies everywhere and by spies I mean the elders the ministerial servants the pioneers any really super into the organization publisher is a spy for them because they'll report on anything anyone does anything anyone says if anything was said to upset the apple cart somebody's gonna know about it because there's a line full of people waiting to tell on somebody else Mm -hmm. so and for you know for Stephen Lett to say that these are apostate lies that we hide pedophiles. And then to find out, that was another story that came out this year about the young lady who um, her family were family friends of his. And that when she was being molested by, it was I believe an elder son uh, in the congregation. And um, it was, I mean, there were more than two witnesses. They, they knew that this actually absolutely happened and nothing was done to the young man. Uh, it wasn't reported to the police. And the parents, just beside themselves, the father who had been a family friend of Stephen Lett, and this was before Stephen Lett became a governing body member, by the way, wrote to him, but he was at Bethel, wrote to him and saying, nothing is being done, you know, what do we do? 
And basically, he told them to leave it in Jehovah's hands. So he knew of a personal case of a family friend whose daughter had been molested. He, it's like he actually had someone close to him that that had happened to. And then to say, these are apostate lies. He is a liar. He's the liar. Mm -hmm. They are liars. And they are lying to millions of people. And the, the millions of people are eating it up. But thankfully, many aren't. And many are waking up. And that's a blessing. Yeah. And I think that that's what Jehovah's Witnesses who first see a video from an apostate or first talk to an apostate, I think the thing that they sometimes focus on is that, well, the apostates are angry. <laughs> Well, right. Yeah, I, I yes, yes. I I don't think I know anyone who's not who I don't think I know anyone who's an apostate who left the Jehovah's Witnesses who's not angry. At or some level. who doesn't have reason to be angry. Yeah, at some level there is anger. Right. And it's if it's if, if nothing else for wasted time. Yeah. You're angry for wasted time. Um, wasted opportunities, mm -hmm. wasted relationships, w you know, so many things in your life were, a, were based on a lie. And when you find out that all of those things aren't true, yeah, it would, it would make you angry. Um, you know, I remember as a kid, my parents talking about how, like, how kind of wrong it is to lie to your little kids about Santa Claus, you know, like that was the thing that we used it to talk about to people in service and stuff, but you know how it's just, it's not right to lie to your children about that kind of stuff. But what we were fed was so much worse than any Santa Claus story. <laughs> yes. We're told we're going to live forever. <laughs> We're told that we we're going to be perfect. We we're told that we were going to survive a great war. We, everything we were ever told about our life is a lie. So for apostates, yeah, apostates are probably angry. Um, at least to a certain extent because it's frustrating to be lied to. And it's frustrating to then want to talk to your parents who taught you all of this stuff and now they won't talk to you. Right. So there's, you, there's no ability to have a conversation. There's no ability to like try and um, wrap your head around all of the decisions that you were made that were made for you when you were young and things like that. There's no opportunity for anything with that because they won't talk to you anymore. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, and something I was thinking about too, the lie of you know that Jehovah doesn't wish any to be destroyed, but wishes all to be saved. And that's why he has given so much time. And that's why the end hasn't come. But you think about that rationale. With every year that passes, the world's population grows by a certain percentage. So that, I mean, I remember when the world population was about 3 billion. I, I do too. That 70s. was the first number I remember. Yeah. And, and now it's closing in on 8 billion. So you're going to tell me that he has waited uh, all this time so that, you know, 8 million people now supposedly are Jehovah's Witnesses or close to 8 million. But 8 billion people are now on the earth. So billions more are going to die than would have died if the end would have come in the 70s. More than double. No, more than double. So he's just he's just waiting till we get to a certain 10 billion maybe and then he can wipe them all out. <laughs> so that rationale it makes absolutely no sense when you break it down into rationality mm -hmm. because for the few, you know, hundred thousand, maybe million that might survive Armageddon because he's extended it to this long, that just means that billions more are going to die. Mm -hmm. God doesn't have a problem with killing billions of people, though. No, no. that is like that is, <laughs> that's his hobby. He, 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 what do you think? Last time. What do you think he started people just so he could have something to kill? <laughs> what? Well, 
Okay, and I'm gonna like really say this kind of paraphrase because speaking about that, I just was listening to, I've been listening to the dramas lately. The last week or so, that's been my thing. The dramas from the 90s and stuff, re-listening to the ones where they dressed up in costume and acted on stage. It's all on YouTube, all these dramas are on YouTube. And it reminds me of something I've been thinking about, about when Jehovah, when they destroyed the walls of Jericho and killed all the people there, take all this stuff. I think it was Achan, Korah, one of these. This dude took some gold and a fine garment and some silver yeah. from Jericho and it was supposed to be dedicated to Jehovah's temple. They but weren't this, supposed to take anything for themselves. Not for themselves. Right. So this guy takes this stuff and keeps it in his tent. Now they go back out to fight. Jehovah God knows this man has done something that he wasn't commanded to. So what do they do? Joshua sends a bunch of people out to fight. Jehovah says, uh-uh, because <laughs> one of you has done something bad, and I'm not going to tell you about it yet. I'm going to wait for thousands of innocent people who are my worshipers. I'm going to wait for them to all be slaughtered first yeah. to teach you a lesson. So they come back from the war and they're like, oh, Jehovah wasn't with us. We lost so many people. And by the way, in the drama I just heard, they changed the number. Oh, 36 people died. Bull, the Bible says thousands. I don't know why they're trying to whitewash these numbers in the drama, but either way. So God allowed his own people carrying his banner, worshiping him, calling upon his name, he allowed them to go out to war and let them be completely destroyed. And then when they come back, then Jehovah says, it was because of this man who took the gold and the silver. But I wasn't going to tell you about it until I let lots of you die. What kind of an asshole God is that? Killing innocent people. And the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you, God would never destroy innocent people without giving a warning first. It says it in the Bible a million times. Well, guess what? He killed his own people there with no warning. Explain that to me. Look it up in your own Bible. Because these are the kind of hypo hypo hypocritical things that are in the Bible that make people like me not believe it anymore because it's too wrong. There's too many instances of too many things wrong. What kind of an animal is this God of the Bible? <laughs> a horrible, horrible, vicious, jealous baby. So I, I just, I was so thinking about that. Yeah. And it just, it just came up again because I just heard this drama. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, you know, here's, the, here's what, this is what we're taught. This is what our life is. So you know? there, so it's like, you know, there are rules, and you must follow the rules, and Jehovah will bless you. But then, there are always exceptions to the rule, things that you have no control over. And you just have to basically trust that Jehovah knows what he's doing, and that uh, everything will work out just like these freaking pedophiles. Leave it in Jehovah's hand. Mm -hmm. Don't report to the authorities. We can't trust the authorities. And we don't want to besmirch Jehovah's name. We don't want to drag Jehovah's name through the mud. Leave it in Jehovah's hands. So, these are the kind of hypocrisies that thankfully thousands of people are waking up. And although we don't make very many videos, I think we made three or four videos this year. Um, we still, people contact us on a weekly basis to, you know, tell us their story, to thank us for the work that we've already done, um, to get moral support, you know, they, it's a very, it's scary when you first wake up. Mm -hmm. It's very scary um, because you don't know where to turn, you know you can't say anything to anybody in That's your congregation, sure. you know. Um, you can't even necessarily confide in your best friend because if they don't feel the same way as you they're gonna turn you in probably mm -hmm. you, know? Gonna, you know that a word is gonna come up and uh, people 
you know, until you get to where we're at, where that word holds no, you know, value to us. It doesn't scare us to be called apostates. We're like, so what? Actually, um, someone else that we grew up with reached out recently to me on Facebook and said, I don't know. She didn't know about our videos. I'll just say that. But I guess we had mutual friends or something. But either way, she said, um, uh, are you still in it? Or, you know, do you believe? Or are you out? And I said, apostate. <laughs> and she was like, oh, good. <laughs> she says, apostates tell the truth. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> we have no reason not to. Yeah. We have nothing to lose or to gain from it. We've lost everything we're going to lose already. Right. So we have no, no kind of agenda here, you know? Yeah, and she's, and here's another one. She's recently woken up. She was married previously to a, a brother who was physically abusive and molested a, a young girl. And the elders wouldn't do anything. So another person that we know. Another. Crazy. It's almost, I would say probably... Well, everyone that I know of, everyone that I've had any kind of confirmation or seen or talked to in the last 20 years, everyone that I knew when I was 18, 20 years old, they're all gone. Pretty much. None of them are witnesses anymore. Because coming up in the time in which we did, and we were told our whole life, prophecy, 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 1914, you know, the generation of 1914, which has since changed, but we were told with no uncertainty this is the time we're living in and as we get older and see that that wasn't true see that 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 they either lied or were misled or were just full of hubris and just talking out of their butts i don't know but it's not true and to anybody with their eyes open we see it and so we left you know and almost all the people i knew are no longer jehovah's witnesses Unfortunately, there's still a few that I know <laughs> that are, and I hope that eventually they will wake up and, you know, actually experience true freedom. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, this is our third year celebrating Christmas, <laughs> and you'll probably see decorations in my wall unit here, of which everything has been given to me um, by my aunt, or by friends and so uh, a few things I purchased myself like the garland or whatever but um, everything else pretty much has been gifts and I treasure them and now we're building our own traditions and we had a lovely quiet Christmas <laughs> and you know it's I never thought that we would celebrate Christmas uh, you know even after we left for the first you know nine ten years I didn't think that we would start celebrating the holidays because we weren't raised with it but um, we've come to like really enjoy just having traditions and and decorating and, and just sort of embracing the season well for me it's different than you like I like having a tree in the house I think that's cool because I like trees I like plants so I like <laughs> that Christmas itself I don't care about I don't, I don't care about. If anything, it separates me from the Jehovah's Witnesses, so I'll do it just for that. <laughs> um, I just, I think that there's more important things. The Jehovah's Witnesses focus on, oh, it's pagan. Oh, it's a wicked celebration. Oh, they don't focus on the things I focus on about Christmas, which is being happy to see friends or, or family, aunt and uncles or something that I haven't seen in a long time. Um, you know, just talking and telling stories and catching up and having a good meal with friends. That's what it means to me. Mm -hmm. um, and somehow the Jehovah's Witnesses overlook all of the positive features of getting together as a family and staying close as a family and telling your, your friends and love your people that you love them and, you know, just not taking for granted that the people that are in your life right now are still going to be there next year yeah. because we don't know. So it's those kind of things that make it special to me. Those are the things that I like about it. Yeah. Um, 
I don't care about Jesus. I don't care about baby Jesus. And <laughs> I don't care if it's pagan. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I, Christmas has nothing to do with religion to me. Right. It's and just a, it's just a tradition and it's, it's a time to celebrate and to add elements into your life that are, are fun and festive. And like you said, to appreciate your family, we went over to his uncle's house mm -hmm. and all the family that was nearby um, came and, and we had a big dinner together and got to, to see everybody and um, it was extra special in a way because uh, the following day his uncle's twin sister mm -hmm. who was in New York passed away and we knew she was we knew she was dying and um, it's been very you know she was a great great woman yeah. so loving and warm and you know um, it's something that he missed out on in his life mm -hmm. growing up not being around his extended non-witness family and not having these you know family traditions and being at Christmases and or Thanksgivings or anything like that that now we get to enjoy and um, you feel the loss though I think I think you feel it too that you didn't have those experiences and weren't close to that side of the family growing up well yeah I mean I have some cousins that are close to my age and stuff that I'm not close with just because I never really saw them but I was thinking when we were over there having dinner I was thinking to myself I think I even probably said it so this is what we like didn't do all those years this is what we withheld ourselves back from doing there's no talk of Christmas there's no talk of religion there's no talk of God there's no presence exchange it's just dinner mm -hmm. with family that's it and if if having a day off from work and calling it Christmas is the excuse you need to get together with your family once a year you should freaking do it like, <laughs> if, if, the, if the government has to give you a day off and tell you you should go be with your family one day a year you should probably think about that whether you celebrate Christmas or not it's, yeah I mean because the thing is especially in your situation um, where he has a very big family um, you know and they're all different religions and belief systems and everything but you know if, if that was the excuse because it's Christmas of not getting together then why didn't your parents make an effort to say okay we're gonna choose another day of the year that has nothing to do with anybody's birthday holiday nothing where we're gonna invite the whole family over um, that lives nearby at least the ones that can come and get together to be with our family it's because they weren't witnesses. You can't be around them. They're not good association. And and think about what you're, you know, what you're saying. I understand what you're thinking, but think about the logistics of that. Yeah. We're gonna get fifty people together on a weekend during a regular week when nobody has time off from work. How much success do you think you're gonna have in getting everyone together? <laughs> At least when it's a Christmas or something, a Thanksgiving. People have the day off. It's not expected that a lot of people will be working. So it's much easier to plan something like that on those days. Mm -hmm. It just makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, like when we were there and we're eating dinner and stuff and people are just all talking and everything, I'm like, so this is the pagan holiday. Yeah. This is the pagan celebration. This is the wicked situation I was had... not allowed to en yes. <laughs> enjoy. Yes, I was not allowed to see turkey and gravy and mashed potatoes and stuff <laughs> because it's all pagan. It, when you look at it as an adult, yeah. you think, how stupid is this? How stupid were these decisions? How, how everyone involved has lost. My dad, my mom my dad's family, us as kids, their kids, everybody loses. Why? It's so stupid. It's yeah. so stupid. And they're good people. They are. And by the way, his dad still talks to all of them. <laughs> Guess I should have been a Baptist or something. They yeah, still talk to me. Maybe. Oh, well. I just, <laughs> it's been a lot of waking up this year. Even though I would consider that I was already awake. 
I think I've just seen a lot of things this year. Yeah. You know, a lot of things frustrating, a lot of things disheartening. Um, we've, but that's... We've had growth. Yeah. In a lot of ways. You have to go through some pain to get some growth, though. That's just how it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, going into 2019, it's, you know, my hope that... I know I'll keep growing. I know that I will keep releasing pain and I know things will come up that will trigger me and you know before just... before we get to our final end of the year things let me do this real quick because I, I've got this on my brain and if I don't just say it I'm gonna keep thinking about it until we make another video okay okay so I've been doing a lot of thinking about God <laughs> <laughs> switching back to switching back to God to King and... Joffrey Jehovah <laughs> <laughs> And this is just a passing thought that I had, and I'm going to tell you guys what I'm thinking about because I never heard anybody really say it before, and um, I don't know. So, as we all know, especially being raised as Jehovah's Witnesses, we know the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Eve talking snakes, Eve eats fruit, Adam blah blah blah, God kicks him out of the garden. Right? Right. Simplified. So God says to them, hold on, I'm going to read it because I want to make sure I get it right. Like, this is what's going to happen to you when I kick you out. When I kick you out of the garden. And he said to Adam, he said, this is uh, Genesis 3, 17. And to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife's voice and from the tree concerning which I gave you this command, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground on your account. In pain you will eat its produce in all the days of your life. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, and you must eat the vegetation of the field. In the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the ground. Blah, blah, blah. So, basically God is saying to man and the woman, because you sinned, I'm going to make your, well, your life will now be difficult. Mm -hmm. Your life will now be very challenging. You will toil to get you know, food from the ground. Your wife will have labor pains. Like, basically, you guys are on your own. And everything's going to suck. <laughs> everything is going to be awful. So, then I started thinking that they started building a tower, didn't they? All those people got together and they started building what we now know from the Bible is the Tower of Babel. And so... I'm going to pick up here in Genesis 11, 5. It says, Then Jehovah went down to see the city in the tower the sons of men had built. Jehovah then said, Look, they are one people with one language, and this is what they have started to do. Now there is nothing that they may not have in mind to do that will be impossible for them. And right there. They, there is God, nothing that they will do that they will put their mind to that they won't be able to do. So God sends man out of the Garden of Eden to toil and basically be punished for his sin. But men are resilient and survivors. And what happens? They come together in unity and are working so well together <laughs> That they're building this massive tower and massive city. And God himself says, wow, there's nothing they won't be able to accomplish. Unless. Let's just stop right done. there. <laughs> so here you have the problem. God takes away his support of mankind. But mankind didn't need it. Because they continued to thrive without God. And what happened? God says, no, 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 no. <laughs> I realize I already punished you guys. I realize you're already corrupted with sin. I realize you're all going to die of old age. But no, what I did to you the first time wasn't enough because now you're proving me wrong. You're proving that you can be successful without God. Well, I can't let that stand. So I will change all of your languages and ruin everything that you accomplish as a unified people. 
So if you really, like for me, what I think of when I hear that is that the problems we have now are because of God. <laughs> like straight up. If people were working together and all speaking the same language, who, who caused that to stop? Who caused the problem? Everything was going great there. But wait, God didn't like it. Mm. So this is, this is why I can't believe in God. This is why I don't believe in God. Or at because least this God. I don't believe in any God, but especially this one. Um, it's just, it's too man-made. This is man-made. These are man-made emotions. Man-made jealousy. Man-made everything. It mm. doesn't, it's not real. And if it is real, why would you worship that God? Why? Why, why, why? A God who destroys good so you won't succeed. That's no God I would ever worship. You know? So that's just what I was thinking about. Something that was on my mind. You know? He's been going on about the Tower of Babel for months. 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 <laughs> I can't believe that Tower so we of Babel gotta make, story. We gotta make a video so you can shut up about that Tower of Babel. That's what has to happen. I just have to say it in a video and I won't think about it. Anymore. It says release. Mm. But I've been thinking about that. I'm thinking, how, is, how has nobody said this before? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe they have. All right. So it's, it's now in a few hours, it'll be 2019. We can leave the Tower of Babel behind us. That's, that's a 2018 problem. <laughs> You need it. You'll find a new one to focus on for 2019. I'll start looking tomorrow. <laughs> oh, but anyways, uh, just but, to okay. I was just gonna say, all things being considered, I mean, yeah, we've talked about some negative stuff tonight, and we've talked about some stuff that's kind of a bummer. But truth be said, happier now than I've ever been. Um, there's not a single solitary day that goes by that I do not that I am not thankful that I left that organization. Yeah. Um, my life is a million times better. Mm -hmm. Our marriage is better. I have more friends. I'm happier. I feel more fulfilled. I've got stuff going on. Mm -hmm. You know, like my life has just exponentially improved. Yeah. Having left that organization. Yeah. And honestly, I don't care what the people in the organization say. I know it's garbage. Mm -hmm. I know it's garbage. They can call me mentally diseased. They can call me an apostate. Their, their words have no weight. They don't know what they're talking about because they have not experienced or even accessed any truth outside of this little bubble that they're living in. So the whole situation to me is just, I'm so great, glad to be free of it. Yeah, so and it's to the point when I get criticism on our videos you know people will still comment on pre old videos and I, I actually do see all of the you know all of the comments I see them um, I don't necessarily reply but when I get those I just have to, I laugh and I also feel sorry for those people because I know they are in darkness and uh, it's too bad it's too bad for them but yeah. I feel the same way that there's not a day that goes by, even if I'm sad about something, even if I'm feeling loss, you know, at missing family relationships, whatever it may be, but I always can shift and say, there's not a day that I'm not grateful though that I walked away from it, you know, mm -hmm. despite the other losses. Uh, which are their choice. That's not my choice. It's their choice. Um, it's, and but I, I feel so grateful that I can be free to explore other ideas, and I I'm not enslaved anymore by by fear. Yeah, and this whole concept that jehovah's witnesses who leave just want to commit sins and they want to live an immoral life that's why they can't be part of god's organization this is the kind Another of life. <laughs> this is, that's the kind of crap that so many jehovah's witnesses say mm -hmm. and the reason is they cannot allow themselves to believe that it's not true mm -hmm. they have to continue believing they have to have to have to 
Because otherwise, when you come to a point where you question your beliefs, you have to make a choice. And that choice is not an easy one. So for people who are in and they still just keep going along with it, I get it. I get why it happens, but it's not a choice I would ever make again. And, and it's just, it's too, it's too difficult. I understand why people have trouble making the choice. It's super, Absolutely. super difficult to Absolutely. leave and lose your family and lose your friends. And if you were born in like us, lose, lose everyone you ever knew. Mm -hmm. um, but. Well, I mean, that, that I, I've been thinking recently about one of my, was one of my dearest friends. And ever since she saw our first video, would not even have a discussion. Like, wouldn't respond to a text, wouldn't respond to a phone call, like nothing. Would not, just a complete cutoff, no discussion um, to ask why we were doing this or whatever. But I'll never forget something that she said once about, um, it was about something else. It was about, you know, learning about how farm, uh, farm rate or factory farm animals are treated and or mistreated and you know trying to make more conscientious food choices and things like that because she had watched these documentaries and she said because once you know you can't not know mm -hmm. and she says so once you learn something you can't unlearn it and I think it's the same for her that the fear of learning about the truth about the truth is um, too scary too scary because she knows that once she learns it, she can't unlearn it. Right. And that's, that is the decision that everyone has to face. I'm going to watch a YouTube video or I'm going to read crisis of conscience, but you know, when you open that book or when you press play, it is going to change your life. Um, everyone knows that when they start down that path, but it's not an easy path. You, the truth will dictate to you what you should do, what your conscience tells you to do. But once you start reading and learning about the, the truth of the organization, I guarantee your conscience doesn't let you go back. Mine didn't, you know, it's well, too- Some people do for well, various reasons. But, it, but, but I'm talking about your conscience. They may fight their conscience and go back to be, have a relationship with family but they know it's wrong. They know it's not true and they do it anyway because they don't want to lose, you know. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, and it, it is a lot to lose and if you don't know any different and don't know that your life actually could be better without it because that's the gamble because you don't know. And you've got everyone telling you don't do it. It's a mistake. Like everyone that's a witness, like there's nothing out there outside there for you. Mm -hmm. Um, they'll chew you up and spit you out. Um, like it's, it's fear. It's all fear based. Everything. The whole religion is fear based fear of dying at Armageddon, fear of displeasing God, fear of sinning against the Holy spirit, fear of fear of fear of fear of fear of fear. Yeah, for sure. So when you don't know, then you have nothing you feel like you have nothing to gain by knowing. So that's why people like, like for instance, my own father, in my last conversation with him, he said, you know, as far as reading Crisis of Conscience, because his father had read it, his father had left the organization and, his, and essentially became an apostate. But, um, and his, my grandfather tried to get my dad to read it. And my dad said, you know, is this going to make me a happier person? Is this going to make me a better person? So it was fear of, I will have nothing to gain but everything to lose by learning this information. And I feel like I have too much to lose by learning the truth. I have too much integrity to myself to continually believe, continue to believe something I'm not sure is true. I would want to know. And I can, I just, I can simplify this for every one of you out there. If you're a Jehovah's Witness and you start looking at videos on YouTube or you read one of those books, you will no longer be a Jehovah's Witness. I can just tell you that right now <laughs> because there's no way 
just like Robin said, there's no way to go back. Once you know, you know. And or at least you won't go back to the same way that you were before. Yeah. I mean, there are people that can turn it back off, you know? I don't believe it. I don't they they can go. Maybe temporarily, I don't know. But what is it doing to them? Yeah. How happy are they? How happy are they? They're not happy. How happy could you possibly (laughs) be doing something you know is just a complete waste of your time, complete false fabrications. Well, that's why they say well, what, ignorance is bliss. Well, we were just talking about that the other day, right? Like, or this today. How many hours do you think you spend in your life going to meetings, spending at assemblies, going out in service, working at Quick Build Kingdom Halls, cutting doing the grass research, at the Kingdom Hall, reading cleaning. the materials? Thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. That's time that you are, we are, never getting back but it has made us experts in the field (laughs) hey we've got tens of thousands of hours in our life dedicated to serving Jehovah so there's not anything anybody out there is gonna say to me that's gonna surprise me because I'm probably one of the most well-read people out there when it comes to this what's going on currently what's in you know I'm not gonna be surprised by any of this garbage yeah. So, uh, what does 2019 hold for? It's going to be interesting to see the development of certain stories that we've heard rumors of and things that are coming down the pipeline. And I don't know, mm-hmm. you know, maybe nothing. Maybe it's just going to be a mundane year and not much is going to happen, but hopefully more and more people are going to wake up and. You know, it's every time we see videos inside of congregations, they're just like they're empty. Yeah, there's that. I'm surprised. Mike and Kim had just shown and just had a new video up, and there was a picture of the Kingdom Hall inside. There was only 14 people in the Kingdom Hall. 14 in was a, it a what is it like a Sunday meeting? What I don't know. It didn't say. It was it it was either the midweek meeting or the weekend meeting, one or the other. 14 people. It, this is what we've seen. You know, some of you guys who are still attending Kingdom Halls out there could probably send us a message to verify, but the attendance appears to be down significantly. Significantly. So there's the other lie that we're selling Kingdom Halls and consolidating because the, the, the field is, because it's growing so much. Does that math make any sense? No, everything, <laughs> everything out of their mouth is a lie. Yeah. You know, everything out of their mouth is a lie because they have an agenda. Mm-hmm. It's not... And they their, don't care about... They do not care about the witnesses. Yeah, They, they don't care. They what, say that they do, but they're lying. They don't care. Well, if they really cared about the people who served in the congregations and who attended the meetings, then they wouldn't be telling them, don't take a job... If, if you're gonna miss a meeting, if, if you don't already have a job, they're telling you don't take a job. Well, that's, that's not good advice. That's not helpful advice. It doesn't serve to, to help anyone there's, because there's no common sense with that decision. It's a hard and fast, a black and white. Well, if you think you could miss a meeting, don't take the job. Well, they're not, that's not helpful. And that's the kind of stuff they tell people in the kingdom halls and people are suffering, you know? People are struggling with the workload they have of doing their day-to-day stuff and being a Jehovah's Witness and feeling guilty that they haven't studied for all the meetings and it's too much. It is. And we feel I feel sorry for them, but you know, hopefully hopefully more will wake up. That's all I can say. Well, and I just know that when I was in it, I felt pretty self-righteous about all that stuff I was doing. <laughs> and I didn't feel very like Oh, I got to do all this. No, I feel, you feel self-righteous about it. You feel like yeah. you're the only one doing the right thing. So it's going to be super hard for these people to like it's true. get out of, you know, to, to, to wake themselves up because they themselves are in like a delusional state where they feel like they have to keep doing this because it's... They have pride in their suffering. True. That's a form of pride. Um, that here... Here we are, you know, we're, we're basically, because we're serving Jehovah, we're, you know, suffering all of these consequences. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and 
this suffering is, is it's a loop. It's a feedback loop of, oh, because we're serving Jehovah, because you serve Jehovah, you're going to suffer. And so people are suffering because they've given up everything and it's feeding into that loop of, you know, and, and it's a form of pride that they're suffering. <laughs> well, it's, it's like just a, it, in a world where there's no evidence of God, where you have no physical evidence of anything with God, if you're suffering, at least it feels like some tangible evidence of doing something. Right. You know, it's like, there, it's something. Right. We're telling you that you're going to suffer because you are in the true religion and Satan is after you and he's going to cause you to suffer. And now you are suffering. Well, that must mean that I'm doing things right. That must mean that I'm in the true religion. Yep. Yep. <laughs> that must mean that Satan's really attacking me. <laughs> and that is the only... I Just imagine going to like an exercise class. Like let's just say like a... I don't want to say yoga because people think it's spiritism. But let's just <laughs> say you're going to a workout class. And the instructor says to you, okay, everybody... I want you to bend down to a position to touch your toes. Now, if it doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right. So I need you to bend down and stretch hard enough until it hurts. <laughs> and then you can feel like you're doing the right thing. And that's kind of how the witnesses are. You know, it's like, you've got to, you've got to serve God, go out in service, attend the meetings, study, do all this, this stuff. But you kind of have to do it till it hurts so that you know you're doing it. It's bad instruction, but that's probably the best, clearest example because that's how I no see it. No pain, no gain. That's right. That's right. No pain, no gain. And the more pain, the more gain, they think, I guess. I, it's just bizarre. We're out of it. We're not, we just don't buy into that anymore. Um... It's very easy to see it for what it is once you're out. Yeah. So anyways, we we wanted to make our yearly wrap-up video because everybody else was doing it, and we figured we'd do it too. And show our faces one more time before the end of the year. Yeah, hopefully I'll get this up. I only got a few more hours to get this up, so we better stop now oh. so that I can edit it and get it up and have it up before midnight. Okay. Well, Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. We'll see you in 2019. Yeah. <laughs> Here's our invisible toast. Cheers. <laughs> see you guys later. Bye.